Good evening and welcome to tonight's driver's ed class. Uh, I am not going to test the waters with uh, this microphone or putting on music. So we're going to just wait for people to sign on in. We've got 17 already. Wow. So remember the routine. You got to sign in on your phone. Sign on your phone and sign on in on YouTube. I'm just taking a look at what I have available for the next few days. I tried to get out calendars to people that gave me their emails. Uh, I think some of you did not send an uh, email to me. So hopefully that calendar uh, idea is going to work. So remember, uh, you can always check to see what I have for openings. Uh, if you are, a, I guess, a member, I guess they ask you to ask for permission and I accept it. So I have been accepting some people. Uh, but for the most part, I am wide open on Saturday and on Monday and Tuesday of next week. So at the end of tonight, I'll go through some. But I do have 4 o'clock open on Friday. That's the only spot I have open for Friday, Saturday, Monday, Tuesday of next week. There's a lot of you that I haven't driven with. So hopefully we can start the process because some of you have been very diligent and uh, texting me and asking for openings and very willing to slide in to any spots that I have open. And some of you already have three hours done, which is pretty good. Three hours at this point is, is decent. Um, so remember to, uh, to sign in on your phone. I know that some of you have been doing it just on YouTube, so I do see that. Um, but for the most part, I can tell um, I'm going to have to uh, check and see what I have for openings. All right. So I am a little bit behind. Uh, yesterday, we were supposed to get through the section on turning, uh, chapter 6 and 7, in section five and eight in the state manual are supposed to be read and done. Uh, so make sure you hand in those questions from chapter six and seven to me. It's supposed to be at the end of last night. And tonight it's chapter three in section six from the state manual. So we are moving right along. We are almost to the midway point for next week. So next week, I don't know if it will actually be on Wednesday. Uh, for the midterm, I may save it for Thursday, being the um, the test, the midterm. But I'll let you, I'll let you know at some point um, that we're going to do that. So it looks like we've just about have a full uh, class. So I'm going to get right into what I wasn't able to cover from last evening. We were talking at the beginning of last night about vehicle movement. We talked about three uh, three types of uh, movement of the vehicle. We talked about pitch, we talked about roll, and we talked about yaw. So now we're going to talk about uh, how that comes to, into play with movement of the vehicle into turns. And we talked a little bit about vision and how vision is the gateway to making good decisions, that if we don't see things well, then we're more apt to assume that it's okay to pull out into traffic or to make a lane change or to pass, and that may not necessarily be the case. So let's go through what the state wants you to know. And I couldn't find this video. I really wanted to find this video in the worst way, and for whatever reason, it did not allow me to do that. Uh, well, anyways, there was a police car that was chasing a vehicle that probably had done some type of moving violation. Maybe there was a warrant on their arrest, and the individual in the car that was trying to get away took the turn, and he took it extremely fast, um, but he didn't crash the car. The hole in the building right there is from a police officer not making the turn as well as the person he was trying to apprehend and started to chase. And it, it's kind of funny watching a police car drive into a building like that. 
because he didn't take the turn right. He was going way, way too fast. He didn't approach it at the right angle. And I'm sure that he is going to be made fun of for the rest of his police career about the guy who ran into a building uh, while chasing a, a criminal. Um, so let's kind of talk about time frames. Uh, this is something that the state wants you to know. Uh, I will test you on this next week. So make sure you take good notes on this section. When you're looking down the road, when you're driving, try to look just as far as your vision will take you. Now, they basically say that in most situations when you're looking, most people can really pick up signs, pavement markings, traffic lights, probably about 20, 30 seconds ahead. Anything further than that, um, you're not really getting much detail. It's really too far away to really start making uh, some quick decisions on what you need to do. But certainly within that 20 to 30 seconds, you've got a lot of information that you should know of what you want to do once you actually get there. Now, the second thing I want you to write down, and this is from last night, and when we talked about lane positions, remember we talked about being in the center of your lane or uh, right of center, left of center, far right, far left. Most of your turns should always be made uh, in the direction that you're turning. So you want to go left of center or right of center. When you're turning, when there are multiple lanes, okay, multiple lanes, so we're not talking about a single lane and just going off to the line, you need to be in the proper lane and proper position to make your turn. You cannot make a turn from a straight lane if it's only giving you a straight arrow. Conversely, you can't go straight in a turn lane. So you need to basically be in the lane that's designated with what you want to do. When it comes to communicating, which we talked about last night, signaling is extremely important. And I will test you on one of these numbers. You need your directional on 100 feet before you make a turn in town. So a lot of people are saying, I have no idea what 100 feet looks like. So 100 feet would probably be the distance between two telephone poles. So what I'd like you to do, and put this in your notes, is find your stop sign and then the closest telephone pole that's to it. Come back one telephone pole, that is when you're putting your directional on. On a highway, it says about 500 feet, and I guess 500 feet would probably translate into the last sign before your exit. So when you look way up the road, 20, 30 seconds on a highway, find your exit, look for uh, some type of a guide sign, informational sign, and then put your signal on. So what do we do inside the car? What, what are the things that we need to make sure that we do when we go for our driver's license? We just talked about signaling 100 feet in town, 500 on the highway. But basically in your car, there are some checks you need to make. First one is look in your rearview mirror. What do you have behind you? Are they going to do what you're doing? Are they going to pass you? Maybe it's a bicyclist. So check your blind spot in the direction that you're turning. Just a quick little movement of your head to your left shoulder or a quick movement to your right shoulder. Now, you don't have to write this down, and I think I've got a, a misspelt or I need a comma in one of these sentences here. But on a right-hand turn, and we're talking about a 90-degree turn, so we're talking about going from a main road to a side road, the speed that your car should be traveling in, to make a good turn should be between 5 and 10 miles per hour. Now, could you push it a little bit further, maybe 12 to 13, um, possibly? But I'd much rather see you right in the middle around 7, 8, or 9, that's probably the sweet spot. And on a left-hand turn, because it's a little bit of a wider turn, with no traffic, you can uh, slow down as you go into your turn. And then once you get to the halfway point, go slightly faster. All right. Now, here are two terms that I want you to write down. The first one I want you to write down is gap. The second one is hold. Now, I know that this probably sounds like, aren't they the same? Well, I guess they could, 
But when it comes to driving, they have basically kind of separated what's the difference between the two. So when you see vehicles that prevent you from entering the main road, you need to look beyond where the cars are and locate what they say is a gap or a hole. So a gap is between space of vehicles. So in your notes, a gap is probably following distance. So if you've got two vehicles that are on a main road, they're probably three to four seconds separating them most of the time. Just normal flow of traffic. You're going to have at least hopefully three to four seconds. So that's a gap. Never pull into that opening. Now a hole is between clusters of cars. So you could have two cars that are three seconds from each other. And then there's going to be like a seven, eight second opening. And then there's five cars that are all clumped together. So you're looking to where is my best opportunity to blend into traffic. Blend with a hole, stay away from a gap. And I've had some of you that drove either yesterday or today. I, I want you to to realize when you go for your driving test, they will not penalize you for letting one or two openings, holes go by. They will definitely probably fail you if you try to squeeze into a gap. So my philosophy, it's better to wait for your best opportunity to find a hole than to take your first opportunity, which is only a gap. So be patient. And wait. I was telling someone today, no lie, I, I took a uh, UNH student for their driver's test because they didn't have a car to use and they wanted to rent the driver's ed vehicle. And I said, sure, that's fine. We went to the DMV. I was in the parking lot watching them leave the parking lot with the licensing examiner. And their, their driver's test lasted less than two minutes from the time you got into the car to go out with the student and explain what he was going to have him do from the student going to the end of the parking lot, coming to a stop sign and pulling out into traffic. He failed his test in less than two minutes, all because he pulled into an uh, out in front of cars way too, too slow. And there wasn't a big enough opening. There wasn't a hole. It was a gap. And it, a car beeped the horn. And once that happened and, they knew that they pulled out when they shouldn't have pulled out. That was the end of the test. So just realize on your driving test, they're going to be looking and see what your decision making is for pulling out into traffic. Uh, always make good vision checks at intersections. I also told people today, never trust traffic lights. Just because it says it's a green light doesn't mean that you should automatically go through if you're the first one. Uh, if you're the first one going through a traffic light, you probably should hesitate a little bit. Make sure no one's running a yellow red light uh, because some people feel the yellow light's going to stay yellow for them and then it actually turns red. But because their speed is so high, they still continue through. Um, I came up with this. So this is my desire for you to implement into your driving. So what I want you to write down when turning out from a stop sign or at the end of a driveway out into traffic flow. There are three things that you should always think about. Does the person that indicates that they're going to turn where I am, so it's not a driveway, they wouldn't be turning into your driveway, they'd be turning into a roadway. So let's just make it a roadway. Is the person that has their signal on turning where I'm trying to get out from? Okay, so do they have their turn signal on? Okay, let's say yes. Second thing, does it look like they're slowing down? No, then they're not going to turn where you are. They're going to probably turn just after where you're coming out from. So when you're pulling out in front of traffic with a signal on, you've got to judge their speed. You've got to ch uh, judge whether their position is indicating they're making a turn where you are. So did they get close to the white line? Did they get close to the uh, yellow left uh, part of their lane? That's going to give you some indicator of what they're doing. So you've got to put these three things together when making a decision of pulling out in front of other cars. Don't have to write this down, but what we have found through studies and just watching people drive, 
a lot of people are going way too fast. Most people making problem, uh, making bad turns, it's they're going way too fast for the situation that they're in. Some people use their directionals at the last second, so that's a late directional. If you're making a bad turn, it's either going to probably be an oversteer or an understeer. Understeer means you're going too wide. An oversteer means that you're not staying in your lane after you come out of your turn. You're going over to the breakdown lane, uh, possibly, uh, or coming into oncoming traffic. Some of you have a problem with this one. You communicate the wrong intention. Okay, you've got to train yourself to know your lefts from your rights. Okay, it's 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 a must. You have to know left from right. Now, I don't think they're going to penalize you if you put an R and an L on your hand. So if you do that on your driver's test, it's probably not the worst thing to do. Uh, a lot of times people can't find the turning area, and sometimes people leave their directional on way too long. Uh, when should you use your directional? And my philosophy, as it was last night, it's better to have it on and not need it than to need your directional and not have it on. Now, in the old manual, there used to be a question, which was question 96, is when do you put your turn signal on? And they gave you five blank slots to uh, put your answers. Uh, so here are the five and two that I've added, okay, which they do want you to do. And they've included this in your state manual. So the state manual, the one that you have now, is a little bit updated from the older one. So the uh, seven situations, you will use a turn signal, changing lanes, which is obvious, turning at an intersection, again, obvious, uh, getting on or leaving an expressway, obvious, Pulling away from the curb. This is the one that a lot of people forget. If you've pulled over to the side of the road because, let's say, a fire truck or a police car is coming up behind you. So when you pull the, next to it, uh, these lot next to are really together. Pulling over to the side of the road and pulling back out into traffic. Needs your directional on both. Um, parking. This is a big one. I've started to uh, do angle parking with some of you and you don't use your directionals on a regular basis. It has to be part of your thought process when it comes to parking now. You just can't blindly look in a parking lot and go, oh, I want to take that parking spot uh, up near the red car and just go up to it and park into that spot. There are other people in the parking lot, whether backing out of parking spaces or people that are behind you or coming towards you, that would really like to know uh, what you're doing. And the only way they're going to know what you're doing is, is if you use your directional. Uh, backing would be like backing into parking spots, uh, backing out into a roadway. Um, it just lets people know which way your car is going in reverse. Other situations that you should be familiar with when it comes to turning and signaling is hand signals should be used if your directionals aren't working. If you have a situation where cars behind you have no idea what you're going to be doing up ahead, like getting on to a highway or getting off, you know, hit your brakes just a couple times, that will make people get onto their brakes. It's a natural reaction. When you see cars in front of you with brake lights on, it should be a natural reaction for you to brake. Uh, parking. You may tap your brakes when you parallel park so people don't come up right behind you. So you uh, you need some necessary spacing in order to get into a parallel parking spot. Sometimes when there's a pothole or something that's in the road, hitting your brakes will al allow people to uh, miss what you see. This is important for you to know for the midterm. The law states that drivers must not follow another vehicle more closely than is reasonable. So in your notes, reasonable is not determined by you. Reasonable is determined by the police officer, the one who writes tickets. Okay, think about that. Reasonable, a lot of this stuff about speed and following distance, this is not what you think is right. It's what people from the outside of your vehicle are looking at you and evaluating. So you've got to get into their mind 
and think about what is a safe what is a safe speed? What is a safe falling distance? So use the four, uh, four second rule, which means that when a vehicle in front of you passes an object like a telephone pole, you're going to count up to four seconds. One, two, three, four. All right? I'm not going to have you count out loud with me, but I really want you to do this in your own head and make sure that you have i i kind of do this when you're driving anyways and i will tell you if i feel you're getting a little bit too close but um i'm, I'm not going to make you count out loud in bad weather of course you're going to do more than the four seconds so it's recommended to be about five or six uh now we're coming uh, uh, on to some driving techniques that you may not look at as being and it's not a law but it is De definitely safety minded. So I want you to write this down and incorporate this in your driving. All right. So I don't think you're going to get marked off on a driver's test per se, maybe not on all of these, but on some of them you may. Like stopped on a hill, one car length back. I don't think they would mark you off on this, but they would mark you off on the second one that on level ground, you've got to be able to see the tires touching the ground. Uh, that's just common courtesy. That's in case you get hit from behind, you're not going to push into the car in front of you. If the car in front of you breaks down, you're going to have some time and some room to go around. So they're going to probably do that one. They're going to probably say that you were a little bit too close on level ground at a stop sign or a traffic light. Same thing with crosswalks. Stay back 10 or 15 feet when someone is in front of you. And this is just me. So I'll, I'll, tell you this is a pet peeve of mine. Uh, Mr. Toll doesn't usually get angry, but if you are waiting at a crosswalk and there is people walking in front of you, if for whatever reason, most people will say after it happens is they didn't mean to do it and they said they just, you know, was going to sneeze or, you know, they were just resting their foot and it wasn't on the brake pedal enough. If you move the vehicle when there are people walking in front of you, I'm not going to be happy. I want your vehicle at a dead stop. I do not want to creep up two inches, four inches, six inches. I don't care. The car does not move when there are people in front of us. Because what you're telling those people is you're going too slow. I'm in a hurry. I want to move. So I'm going to move a little bit to see if you move a little bit faster. I do not think that is being a responsible courteous driver. So I'll call you out on that. So don't do that. Fire trucks responding to alarms should not be followed. So if they're going to a fire, why would you chase behind a fire truck? So um, I don't think most people would do this. And I don't know why they still have it in the manual, but they do. So stay back 500 feet. And by the way, anything that deals with fire trucks in New Hampshire when it comes to numbers will always have a five in it. So when you see a question about fire trucks or fire hydrants or fire stations and they have numbers, look for a number that has a five because that's going to probably be your answer. It could be at the beginning or it could be at the end. So I'll point those out as we get to them. Okay, let's talk about tailgaters. What are we going to do to people that get too close to us? Okay, I think we know what we want to do. Okay, and it probably isn't something we want to speak out loud, and it's probably not pretty nice. We probably want to probably roll down the window and give the person a piece of our mind or a certain finger that we have on our hand. Uh, but there are better ways to deal with tailgaters. And the first one that they feel is somewhat useful, and I'll kind of disagree with being useful, is by tapping your brakes. By doing that, you're letting people know, I know that you want to go faster than I'm going, but guess what? I'm not. So back off. That's what tapping your brakes basically means. Now, there are going to be two things that happen when you do that. One is, yeah, they're going to say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm too close. And you're going to see them slow down and back off. I would say 70 to 80% of the time, that's not going to happen. I think there's going to be more of a 
confrontational situation. There's going to be a negative situation coming up now. Is a lot of times people say, "Oh, you think uh, you think I was following you close before? Now that I know it bothers you, I'm going to get even closer." Or they may try to start to pass you in situations that put you at risk, like on hills and curves. So be very careful about tailgaters, because the minute you know that they're upset and they're not liking you tapping the brake, go right to number two. Slow down, move to the right, but do this in a place that they can legally and safely pass. So you're still moving on number two. All right, you're still moving, but you're going slower, going to the right, maybe waving them on. But if there is no place for them to safely pass you, then you do have to go to situational three. You need to pull over and let them pass. It's much better to have disgruntled drivers in front of you than behind you. Okay, you do not need that added stress. Now, some people have asked, Mr. Tobut, if I speed up, if I go faster, would that be a better situation? No, because I find that for the most part, you can never satisfy someone that wants to go faster. So let's say that it's 30 and you're getting tailgated. If you go 35, they're going to probably still tailgate you the same distance at 35 as they were 30. So why would you go 40 now in a 30 or, or 45 in a 30? Because they're not backing off. So don't stop putting yourself in a situation where you're trying to appease them and make them happy with going faster. It's much better just to let them go by. We were talking earlier tonight about time intervals. I do want you to know this for next week. We already talked about looking as far as you can down the road where you can actually get specifics about what's happening. So 20, 30 seconds is the basis of looking ahead. But now I want to break it down into specific time frames of what's going to happen within those certain periods. So let's say 20, 30 seconds up ahead, you're looking, you see a traffic light that's green, you see a pothole that's possibly in your lane that you could hit, and you see a dog that is loose, it's not um, being walked by a owner, and it doesn't have a leash or anything, it's just a loose dog. So we're looking up the road and we see three things that we think we're going to have to do. So what you need to do is to put in order which one are you going to encounter first. And with each situation, you're thinking about what am I doing with my speed and what am I doing with the position of my vehicle? So let's deal with the dog first. Okay, that's the closest one. So the dog is off to the right. So you'd probably slow down because you never want to hit a dog going faster. You want to hit a dog going slower. And actually, you don't never, you never want to hit a dog. So you're going to go slower and you're going to go left of center. You're not going to go over the center line to far left because there's an oncoming car. So you're going to go left of center and slow down. Okay, the dog stayed off to the side, and you just go, that was close, and you feel much better about it. Now, here comes the pothole. So now you're going to straddle the pothole, but you, now you're going to go to right of center, and you're going to maintain speed. There's no reason to go slower with a pothole that you're going to straddle, but now the traffic light that was green at one point, you're looking up ahead, is now yellow, so now you're starting to brake and you're going back to the center position of your lane. Driving a car causes you to make hundreds, hundreds of these decisions in just a short drive. You're constantly processing all this information. We don't even know at times what we're actually doing unless you do commentary driving and then your mind is actually speaking out loud what you're thinking. Uh, which is kind of good, and you'd be surprised. You'll be talking a lot when you do that commentary driving if you do it well and you pick up all these things. Uh, this is wrong. It's not three seconds. It's four seconds. I think this is an old slide. And then anything less than three seconds is what we can consider a crash zone. Uh, oh, five to 15 seconds is response time, and that's basically what I was just doing with you of how you are going to handle those three situations. And then crash zone, put it this way. If I'm braking in the driver's ed vehicle, I feel that you're in a crash zone. I feel that there's a problem that I can't speak to you to handle, um, and then there's a problem.
One thing that we probably won't do in the driver's ed vehicle is pass people. It's not something that I say, okay, uh, we're going to drive today and I'm going to pick on the top person. I'm going to pick on Ben. I'm going to say, Ben, we're going to drive around today until we find somebody to pass. That just isn't going to happen. If we're in a situation where passing is allowed, it's legal, and it can be done safely, I would encourage you to try it. I think passing is a good skill to know how to do, but it's not something that we're going to work on in the 10 hours in the driver's ed program. So passing does need extra judgment and skill of knowing distance and speed of other cars. So if I feel that you have that, then we will try it. Also remember, if you do it at night, it's harder to judge speed because of the headlights. You don't see the outline of a car and you would probably misgauge the, the speed that cars are normally going. During the day, I find most people are somewhat accurate on making de decisions, but at night, I'd say only half the people really probably do it correctly. Studies have shown that at 50 mile, uh, 55 miles per hour, you basically need uh, 10 to 20 seconds to pass a vehicle. Now, the faster your car is, the shorter the time and the distance. The slower your car can move, it's going to take longer. So know your vehicle, know your capabilities, know what you're going to have to do in order to make a successful pass. But if we were to break it down step by step, the first thing is the most important thing to remember. If you don't think that you can do it, don't do it. So if you're doubting, if you're nervous, scrap it. Try another time. And probably the first place you want to try is on a one-way highway that has multiple lanes. That's the best way to pass because really in reality, that's a lane change. Passing when there's only a single lane and it's oncoming traffic, this is the difficult pass to do because you got hills, curves, and oncoming cars. So if you make a mistake, it could be fatal. Check the passing lane, because surprisingly, you're coming up on a slow vehicle. Well, there could be cars behind you that see that too. And all of you want to get by that super slow driver. So check your blind spot signal and move over to the passing lane and keep up your speed. Now, when I say keep up your speed, and you want to put this in your notes, you should be going probably about 10 miles over what the posted speed limit is. So this begs the question, and a lot of people ask me, can I go above the speed limit to pass a car? Technically, no. You're, the way it's written in the law books is that you cannot pass a car that's going to speed limit. But we know that doesn't happen. We know people are going 58, 59, and a 55, so they're three or four over the speed limit, and we think they're going too slow. So now we're passing them going 65, 70 miles per hour. That's not what you should do. Okay, you really shouldn't do that. And you definitely don't want to do that on your driver's test. Now, when you do get a chance to try your first pass, when do you know it's time to go back, to go back into the lane that you just came from? This I want you to remember for, I don't think it's in the midterm, but I do believe I use this as a question on the final. When you can see the headlights of the car that you've just passed, so both headlights, the whole grill, when you see the grill in your rearview mirror, then it's time for you to move back over to the right. You don't have to make a mirror check, um, I mean a side mirror check or a shoulder check, just your rearview mirror check, seeing both headlights in the grill is all you need. So signal, and then get back into your lane within 200 feet of an oncoming vehicle. Passing on the right. When can you pass a vehicle on the right? Now, the last two are real obvious, like downtown Durham. You've got a one-way street with two lanes. You can pass right to left, left to right. The last one, multi-lane highway like the Spalding or 95, we've got three or four lanes. You can pass left to right, right to left. Here's the one that most people do not remember. It's when someone in front of you is turning left. But you've got to include the top bullet if there's enough pavement to allow you to make that type of a pass. You should never leave pavement to go around a car that's turning left. Okay, stay on the pavement. They get close to the yellow line because they're making a left-hand turn. You can go far right and go around. Now... Let's say a car is turning right 
can you go over the yellow line to pass a car that's going slow in front of you making a right hand turn no you're supposed to match their speed by going slow allow them to make that right hand turn but you are not legally allowed to go way over the yellow center line to pass somebody okay so write that down in your notes a lot of people make that mistake these are all situations when passing is not allowed um, unless the left lane of the road is clear uh, so we just talked about hills and, and curves and things like that now here's a hundred feet of a viaduct bridge or tunnel so anything on the highway that has any type of barrier that could come into play if you were to leave the roadway they're going to probably put up signs saying no passing and of course railroad crossings and intersections should probably not pass in case things change real quickly no passing zone signs are marked by signs in your notes i want you to write this down uh there it's called a pennant shaped sign and it's located on the left side of the road very few signs you'll ever find when you drive will be on the left hand side i'd say 90 95 percent of all signs are to the right because that's the side of the road you're driving on the reason why we have no passing zone signs on the left is that if you are passing a large truck you're going to only see signs on the left hand side the truck is so large and you're right side by side with them for a period of time any sign off to the right will be blocked by that truck and you're just not going to be able to see it and i'll point that out when we drive and we get there uh, this is kind of common sense stuff but let's think about it if you're driving downtown durham um, or any place where there are two lanes right side of the road is for normal traffic flow slow moving cars left side is for passing multi-lane highways you should always drive in the right lane or the middle because uh, that's for the super slow or the smooth and the left always needs to be open for people passing in massachusetts and you may want to write this down if you ever plan on going to massachusetts is that the left lane is only for passing so if you stay in the left lane for any period of time you will get pulled over uh, my son found that out the hard way okay uh, and also the other thing he found out was is that when you have your headlights on oh no when you have your windshield wipers on in rain you need to have your headlights on so he didn't have his headlights on and he was in the left passing lane so you will have to know these things when you go from state to state a lot of times they'll have it posted on billboards as you cross over into a different territory so just make sure that you understand that uh, lane changes uh, this is the last slide for turning so what I want you to write down is these four things. Now, the state basically breaks it down into the acronym SMOG, S-M-O-G, S-M-O-G. And what S-O-M-G stands for is signals, so I put directionals, mirrors, so rear and side view mirrors. They call a blind spot check over the shoulder check, so that's the O, and G is go. Now, and that's the simple way to kind of remember it the last one with go i want you to write it down the way i have it on the board here increasing your speed i would say 80 90 percent of the time lane changes should be a slight increase of speed maintaining is when there's nobody on the road it's only you you're just going through the formalities of making a lane change so if you're going 22 I'd put my directional on, check my mirrors, check over my shoulder, and I'd move over at 22. I wouldn't change my speed at all. If you look in your blind spot and you have someone that's right beside you, this is where you may slow down and let that person kind of move beyond where you are so you can slide over to the other lane. So braking on some lane changes is advisable. But for the most part, I would say increase your speed most of the time. Think of lane changes almost like a, um, a game of tag. When you play a game of tag, you want no one to catch you. So when you see someone coming towards you, you run faster. So when you're making a lane change, you're driving faster so they don't catch up where you're going. 
So that's the way we're going to do it. And that's usually our fourth time out driving where I use lane changes or we do that type of a lesson. All right, so this goes right into tonight's topic, sign signals, payment marking. So I know I'm not going to have enough time to go through all of this tonight. Um, this is a big section. Like I told you last night, it's one of my favorite sections to cover in the manual and in the textbook uh, because this is the, the basis of really opening up um, your knowledge base of why we have all these things out on the road and what do they truly mean and how do I um, interpret and um, move in these areas where I'm successful uh, getting through intersections and um, how do I handle yield signs and right of way, all these things. So we're trying to make sense of what's happening. And as you can tell from the picture, this is close to the high school. This is near the junior high where I normally will take you when we go out for our first drive. So we've got stop signs and we've got road markings. We've got a crosswalk. Uh, we've got a lot going on here. So we have to kind of process. Oh, here we go. We got a quiz. So what I want everybody to do, and um, I'll give you a moment, get a blank piece of paper, because let me get something up here. Oh, I've got the wrong thing. I don't want that. I need my timer. So let me get my timer. I am going to give you, whoop. I gotta get the uh, right amount of time. I am going to give you six minutes. I think that's six minutes. Do I have a six minutes? Let me get out of here. I'll go back into it and try it again. So get out a blank piece of paper. Let me get my timer up again. I am going to give you six minutes. Here we go. All right. You've got six minutes now to do this quiz. So read the instructions, and I want you to match the symbols to the wordings. Okay? It is a... Um, a matching quiz. All right. So let's see how much you know about signs. So I'm good. You've got five minutes and 40 seconds to complete this.
Okay, we're about halfway through. Okay, start wrapping it up. You've got one minute left. Okay, time is up. We've run out of time. Now, the reason why we did this tonight is that on your state driving test, remember your, your written knowledge test is 40 questions, 10 will be with signs. So it's really important that you have a basic understanding of shapes and colors and meanings of what are going to be found on signs. So what I'd like you to do is to take your phone and text me um, the answers that you have. All right, so um, I want you to text me right now. Just take a picture of it, what you wrote down on a piece of paper, and then we're gonna then we're gonna go over it. So text me the picture right now, so I know that you've got it. I'm gonna wait till my phone starts blowing up, and then we're gonna go through the test. Mm -hmm. Now, surprisingly, I have a feeling that a lot of people um, probably didn't do too well. So don't be discouraged. This is to show you basically uh, what you know and what you don't know. So some people, there we go. Now I'm getting more. Okay, I'm getting more people. This is good. This is good. Now, some of you that are online here, so Sam is one, um, um, Min is one, uh, Ragva is one. Uh, you've got to make sure that you uh, text me 
So remember, a lot of this information that you're sending to me is through text messages. Okay, I think I've almost got enough that we can actually correct it. Now, before we correct it, I want you to take a look at the shapes of the signs up ahead. If you take a look at shape A, C, E, G, and I. All right, so A, C, E, G, and I only have one meaning. Those five signs, A, C, E, G, and I only have one meaning. So once you use that letter down below, you don't use it again because that is the only meaning you will find on the sign. If you take a look at D and F, if you did your reading, then basically you know that these two signs deal with construction. Orange means construction. So the rest of your quiz was between two signs. It was between B and H. So the majority of your answers down below should be B or H. Kind of strange, isn't it? All right, so let's go through what the answers are. Okay, question number one, 35 miles per hour, that's H. Two, bump, that's a warning, that's B. Three, dead end, that's B. Four, detour, that's D. Five, detour, a thousand feet, that's F. Six, divided highway ends is B. 7, do not enter is G, do not pass is H, end of construction is F, flagman is D, that's 10, 11, hill is B, 12, left turn is H, 13, no passing any time is H, 14, no passing zone is C. 15, no turn on red is H. 16, no U-turn is H. 17, pass with care is H. 18, road machinery ahead is D. 19, road narrows is B. 20, slippery when wet is B. 21, soft shoulder is B. 22, speed limit is H. If anybody got 23 wrong, shame on you. You're in the wrong course. That is A. 24, stop ahead is B. 25, stop for school bus is B. 26, stop here on red is H. 27, truck route is H. 28, two-way traffic is B. 29, wrong way is I. And 30 is yield, that is E. So what I'd like you to do is to mark the ones that you got wrong and just text me the number you got wrong on the quiz. All right, so I've got what you've got. You've, you've sent me your picture of the test. Now I want to uh, see what you got for a score. So just send me the number. Like I said, it has no bearing. It just gives me some idea of what you know about signs, maybe what I've got to concentrate a little bit more on um, next week when we finish up the, the section on signs. So just, just text me the number. Mark them wrong. So let's kind of break down the importance of, of signs. Signs really provide a whole lot of information. And the problem with signs is that they get so, uh, so much information and depending on how fast we're traveling that we may not be able to process everything it's trying to communicate. But in a sign like clumping of this magnitude, there's no way you're going to be able to read this while you're driving. You're going to have to stop park the vehicle, read it, and make sense of what it is. And notice it says no parking anytime to the left. If you're parking to the right, it's only 15 minutes. 
6 a.m. to uh, 6 p.m. If it's below that, it says no parking on either uh, left or right on the second or fourth Tuesday of the month between uh, midnight and seven in the morning. So it is a ton, a ton of information. So what we are trying to do now with signs and signals is to break it up into four categories. So please write down the four categories. The first thing I want you to know is that there are seven colors when it comes to sign. So we're going to go through each of the colors. All right. So seven colors. There are multiple shapes and there is no way we're going to go through all of them, but most of them can be found in the in responsible driving does a better job than the state manual going over the shapes, but we'll go over the main uh, shapes. But then we can also break signs into two other uh, categories. And one is regulatory, which is law. And the other category is uh, a warning. So color and shape, regulatory and warning. So when you're approaching down a roadway, you should be processing in your head, okay, what's the color? It's green. It's blue. What is the shape? It's a rectangle. Okay. Is it a warning? Yes, it is. Is it a regulatory? Yes, it is. And you're process, processing this as you get closer until you can actually read the lettering or the symbol that's on the sign. So of all the different colors, the most important is the red sign. A red sign, and most everybody, if you were to, to stop anybody on the street and said, name a red traffic sign, I would probably say 90% of the people would say a stop sign. Every once in a while, you'll get someone that's thinking outside of the box and, and they'll say wrong way or do not enter. And that would still be classified under the red category of stop or don't do something. Um, now, we'll, we'll get to stopping in a second, but let's take a look at the difference between a rolling stop and a resting stop. Okay, I do want you to write this down. The difference between the two, well, just in the word rolling means that you really haven't stopped. How can you be rolling and not moving? Stopping means no movement. So in your notes, a resting stop has pitch. So when we pitch, as we said last night, we move forward and then we come back. A rolling stop, there's a hesitation or a continuation of your rolling and this is where it really gets dangerous is when you have people making right turns so in your notes I want you to write down rolling stops usually happen on right hand turns most people will approach as the situation here in this picture they're approaching from the left if you take a look at the left of the picture there is a stop line there is a stop sign that's the second sign um, that we can see on the left we can see the silhouette of the octagon when people are coming around the corner, they're looking for a opening in traffic. Once they realize there's no traffic coming, in their mind, they believe they've already come to a stop. But in reality, they're still moving. Hence, they have a rolling stop. Okay? And stop lines are there for a reason. Okay? So think about this. You have a red stop sign. They could paint that white stop line anywhere. It could be where it is now. It could be a foot closer to the crosswalk. It could be up two feet. So when given an opportunity to choose between a sign or a line, the line is there for a reason. Take the line. If you don't see the line, then use the sign. And it's better to stop even if you don't think that you should. Okay. A lot of people, I, I, I find it kind of funny that a lot of people will come in this situation and they'll look at me and they'll go, Mr. Toll, do I really have to stop at that stop sign? I go, well, I feel like saying, what's our other option? What do you mean, do we have to stop at the stop? Yes, it says stop. We've got to stop. So, yes, we've got to stop at stop signs. Uh, let me go back one from here. I got a quick, let's do this first. Okay, stopping and yielding. What is the difference between the two and why aren't? drivers doing them correctly. So let's kind of break this down just a little bit more. So with stopping, it means a complete stop, like we said before about pitching. Uh, you're going to wait until crossing vehicles or pedestrians have cleared. So we're talking downtown Durham or Dover. And with a line, that is where we're basically 
going to stop. Now, underneath the word stop is some real important information. I kind of like this picture. That's why I put it in the PowerPoint. I like where it says stop means stop. But what I really wanted to write or to have in the, included in the picture here is where it says all way. So in your notes, what you're going to find at times that there are different types of intersections with stop signs. So what I want you to write down, what we have found, there are four-way stops, there are three-way stops, there are all-way stops, okay? So what this is telling you that we know that we have a stop sign, but it's also communicating who else around the roadway at the intersection also has. So basically, all-way and four-way means the same. If it's a three-way, that means that there are three stop signs. And so if there's just three roads, then that accounts for everybody. But every once in a while, you may find three stop signs with one person not having a stop sign. And I like this picture. At times, you may have branches or snow covering a sign. So even though we can't read it, we don't see what it says. We know by the color and the shape. We know it's communicating what we need to do. So a rolling stop is where you hesitate and there's movement. Um, how to make the correct hand checks or head checks at a stop sign. As you approach an intersection like this, so we're not quite at the stop line yet, you should start reading what's below the stop sign and analyzing before you get there what you're going to have to do uh, in regards to making checks and where other people may have their stop signs. So in this case, I believe it's a two-way stop. We have a stop sign. The truck over there has a stop sign, but the yellow sign indicates that crossing traffic does not. And when you come to a stop sign, you should always check your rearview mirror to see how close people are with you and whether they've got their directional on and where they're turning because they may be going in the same direction that you're going. And always check left, right, left before you move out from a stop. So left, right, left. Okay, you should know that for the midterm or the final. So well, since we're on the subject of stopping, a close related cousin to stopping is the yield sign. And a lot of times people are really confused what, we, what yield means. So in driving, a yield or give way sign indicates that merging drivers must prepare to stop if necessary. So a yield sign is telling you, you may have to stop if there are cars coming on the main road. But if there are no cars coming, then you can continue on at a good, slow, safe speed. So another word, for you can write this down. Whenever you see a yield sign and you start looking at traffic, the word that you should start thinking about now is not yield, but think of the word wait. When I get down to that sign, should I wait or should I go? If you're waiting, then you're going to be stopping. So that's what yielding means, is giving up your roadway for someone that's on the main road. So we yield for cars, we use for pedestrians. So we need to analyze the position of everybody. Um, don't trust directionals um, or lack of directionals because people may have left them on or they're going to forget to use them all along. All right, so let's get back to the, oh, one more. Okay, yielding on the highway is a little bit different than in town because your ramp is ending. Um, so remember, it's the same. You're going to have to wait if there's too much traffic on the highway, but basically on a ramp, keep up your speed, 35, 45, uh, 40 miles per hour. Just before you get to the yield sign, look in your mirrors to see, do you need to wait or can you can continue down the ramp picking up your speed? So checking in your uh, rear view mirror, side view mirror, and then making a shoulder check which is considered a blind spot check before you start merging out into traffic. Usually we start hitting up um, highway driving and ramps right around our seventh time out driving. That's the lesson where I usually start uh, bringing that 
um, up in our drive. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is the color white. So we had red for stop or don't do something. White is for regulatory. Okay, so write down law. Law and regulatory means the same thing. And if you want to really impress your parents and let them know that you're really learning something in driver's ed, ask, ask your parents this question tonight after you're done. Ask your parents how many uh, subcategories of white signs are there. Ask them, what does a white sign mean? And say, do all white signs mean the same thing? Because most parents will say, oh, white signs are laws. Yeah, they, they would be correct in that. But you've got to realize that white signs can be broken up into three subcategories. So what I want you to write down in your notes, I want you to write down white signs with black lettering, red lettering, and green lettering. Okay, so black, red, and green. So white with black, and the example we have here in the picture is a speed limit sign. So white with black is telling you to do something. White with red is telling you not to do something. White with green is guiding you to what's legal and what is not. It's giving you directions to what you can and cannot do. So in this case, parking is allowed for two hours, Monday through Friday, between 8 in the morning and 5 at night. But if you park right here in front of the telephone pole Monday night at 7 o'clock, you could park there for five hours, for six hours. It's not going to cause you to get a ticket because it's legal to park that length of time. So it's only restricted with the dates or the days and times. The next sign color we're going to cover is blue. And the terminology I want you to write down is motorist services. The top picture really breaks it down into like five or six different symbols that would communicate certain things like gas, food, lodging, telephone, camping. Okay, so you get a lot of information right on that blue sign. And it tells you it will be found at exit 7 or 8E. So if you want food, take one of those exits. If you want to find a telephone, take one of those exits. Now, if you're looking for a hospital, it's not on the sign. That is not the exit you would take to go to a hospital. So a hospital is a blue sign, but you've got to wait till you find the symbol H to indicate that. Now, the most common blue sign that we have around is that all government buildings, all municipal buildings, is the handicap sign. Any building that has any type of clients or people that uh, need to attend, there are no pack, uh, there are handicap parking signs uh, allowing them to park. The biggest category of signs out there are yellow signs. I would say there are well over, I don't know, 50 to 100 yellow signs. So what I want you to do right now, and we haven't done any questions on YouTube today, um, I want everybody to give me an example. And you can't use the ones that are on the, the slide right now. So you can't use these at all. So you've got to come up with what yellow sign you would find on a roadway. Okay, so the regular color yellow, which is the top picture with the stop sign symbol, is a general warning sign. That's just a regular yellow sign. In your notes, what I want you to write down is that if it is a yellowish greenish or what we call a neon yellow, it has to do with crossings or school zones. Okay, so a crossing or a school zone. Oh, speed table, good. Intersection, good. You guys are coming up with some good ones. I like them. Keep them coming. Let's see what else we got. Come up with some more yellow signs. Let's go to the next color. Oh, here's school zones. And school zones, falling rocks. I like that. Uh, school zones, the speed limit will be different. And speed limits by schools will always drop 10 miles below the posted speed limit. So write that down in your notes. When you're going by a school zone, 
it's going to drop by 10. So from 8.15 to 9 and from 2.45 to 3.30, Monday through Friday, the speed limit changes. Sharp curve, railroad crossing, narrow bridge, change of speed by 10, that's good. Sharp curve, drastic turn, good. Animal crossings, crossroads, turn, awesome. You guys are really coming up with some good examples. I like it. Animal Crossing, good. Okay, green signs. Windy Road. Bridge Height. Oh, that's a good one. No Outlet. That means Dead End Street. Cliff, yep, good. Moose Crossing, good. I like them. Uh, green sign means direction or guidance. We find these on highways. We will find green signs in town too to give us uh, some direction of uh, where things are coming from. I want you to realize that street signs, even though in New Hampshire they're mostly green, you can write this down in your notes. And I just found this out. I was teaching for like over 20 years and someone told me something different. I go, you know what? I never heard that before. Um, I guess it makes some sense, but street signs in different states can be different colors. In New Hampshire, we usually use a green color um, sign to indicate the street you're looking for. But there are three other colors that they can use for street signs. So if you want to write this down, red, blue, and brown. For whatever reason, some states will allow you to have, have red street signs or blue street signs or brown street signs. We do have a brown uh, street sign in Durham, and I'll try to point it out to some of you when we get done uh, near it. But normally, you, it's always green here in New Hampshire. I thought this was kind of an interesting sign. Just so you get in the habit of seeing signs, every once in a while, you'll see a sign and you'll go, that's kind of odd. Uh, why would you tell somebody that was living on the West Coast that if you get on Interstate 20 and head east, Boston, Massachusetts is uh, over 3,000 miles away. That's kind of far to indicate where you're going to be heading. I don't think anybody, and look how quaint that town looks. I don't think very many people in that town thinking, you know what, today, let's just uh, get in the car and let's head to Boston. That, that will take us about four days, three days. Um, that's my nephew's out on the West Coast, and I, I think I saw he had that posted once because he was originally from Massachusetts and then he moved out to Oregon. So he had this on his timeline once on Facebook. Thought it was kind of funny. Brown sign is one of the least colors that we see out on the road. So here's a uh, park, Hilton Park, which is down in Dover Point. Uh, notice on that uh, sign, we actually have three colors. We've got the street name, We've got the recreation site, and we've got the services being the DMV uh, motor vehicle testing site. So as you're driving, you're really processing this information quite quickly. Uh, some of that information may be useful to you, but at times that information, you know, may not mean anything to you. Orange is pretty common in the summertime. We've got construction going on. Um, so just be aware of construction work, as we'll talk more about that when we talk about uh, speed zones and construction zones and things like that. But the two shapes that we had on the quiz, one was a guide, guiding you to you know when uh, construction is um, where it's going to move you, you know, and then you've got your diamond shaped signs telling you where you need to go or what's up ahead. Now with traffic lights, so let's kind of switch gears here a little bit because we talked about um, colors. Uh, there are colors on traffic lights. So what I want you to realize that the most important color on a traffic light is red. So from top to bottom, it goes red, yellow, green. So we all know what red and green mean. Red means stop. They do not want you to go through the intersection. Uh, green means that you can go, but only after checking. When the light turns green, you should still wait and check, make sure no one's running the intersection. And yellow is where everybody has the difficult time. What do we do with a yellow light? With a yellow light, it depends on when it turns yellow and how close you are to the intersection. 
and we're going to have a slide coming up which talks about and I I coined the term the point of no return there comes a time on the roadway a position on the roadway where if you even tried to stop at a yellow light you're not going to stop at the line you're going to get you're going to stop beyond the line in the middle of traffic that's probably not the best thing at that point you probably should have gone through so we'll talk more about that but what i liked about this picture because i always if i had you in class i'd ask what color is the light in the picture and most people say it's yellow i go what do you mean yellow i just told you red is in the top yellow and then green why are you saying yellow but it looks yellow it looks kind of orange yellow mr told that's that's not a red light no it is a red light it just doesn't look red so people that are colorblind people like we said last night you have to know which light is on the top light is on that is red the reason the camera just didn't filter out um, the brightness to give it a true red color and it kind of bleached it out a little bit but that is a red light how about lights that are confusing now this is over in Europe I think this is an art exhibit but if I saw that I would kind of freak out and let's talk about how lights work okay traffic lights are activated by a magnetic loop that's underneath the pavement so when your car goes over that it senses that you're there and it will either keep the light green or change the light to green for you if it's red uh, as you approach there are computer terminals around the intersection that kind of gather the information of people that want to travel uh, at the intersection or pedestrians that want to travel and I really believe that if you look at a traffic light and start to understand how it changes uh, then I think you're going to probably be pretty accurate in guessing on when your green light will change to yellow and for those of you that have been driving with me for a while you basically know I'm about 80 to 90 percent right within a few seconds of when the light is going to change one way or the other now I found this uh, video so I'm going to show we haven't seen much for videos tonight but I thought this video was very helpful in understanding the flow of traffic so let's take a look at how does traffic how do lights sense traffic okay if you live in a major city I can take a pretty good guess at one of your most common frustrations traffic in city driving the journey is rarely better than the destination in most cases we just want to get where we're going traffic is not just frustrating but it has consequences to the environment as well all those idling vehicles have an impact on air quality when you're stuck and sitting behind a long line of cars it's easy to let your mind wander over solutions to our traffic woes but traffic management in dense urban areas is an extremely complex problem with a host of conflicting goals and challenges one of the most fundamental of those challenges happens at an intersection where multiple streams of traffic including vehicles bikes and pedestrians need to safely and with any luck efficiently cross each other's paths over the years we've developed quite a few ways to manage this challenge of who gets to go and who gets to wait from simple signs to roundabouts but one of the most common ways we control the right-of-way at intersections is the traffic signal I'm Grady and this is Public Works, my video series on infrastructure and the human-made world around us. This video is sponsored by Squarespace. More on that later. There are a lot of good analogies between cities and human anatomy, and roadways are no exception. Highways are like the aorta, with a high capacity and single major destination, Small collector roads are like the capillaries, with not much capacity but a connection to every individual house and business. And in between are the aptly named arterial roadways, the medium capacity connections between urban centers. Rather than ramps, overpasses, and access roads to control the flow of traffic, arterial roads use at-grade intersections through which only a few traffic streams can pass at a time. We call this interrupted traffic flow for obvious reasons. In most cases, these intersections are the limit to the maximum throughput of the roadway. In other words, increasing the number of lanes or speed limit won't have any effect on the overall capacity of the road. The only way to increase the number of vehicles that safely travel from point A to B is to increase the efficiency of the intersection. In addition, these intersections are where a vast majority of accidents occur. 
For these reasons, traffic engineers put a lot of thought and analysis into the design of intersections and how to make them as safe and efficient as possible. Controlling the flow of traffic through an intersection, otherwise known as assigning right-of-way, is an enormous challenge and almost always requires a compromise of numerous conflicting considerations, including space, cost, approach speed, cycle time, site distance, types and volumes of traffic, and human factors like habits, expectations, and reaction times. Intersections also need to be rigidly standardized so that when you come to an unfamiliar one, you already know your role in the careful and chaotic dance of vehicles and pedestrians. From a throughput standpoint, the ideal intersection would cause no interruption to flow whatsoever, but you can't put a high five interchange on every city block. On the other hand, simple signs are cost effective and don't require any extra space, but they can't handle a lot of volume because they create an interruption for every single vehicle passing through the intersection. You can see why traffic signals are so popular. They aren't a panacea for all traffic problems, but they do offer a very nice balance of the considerations we discussed before. Relatively low cost, minimal space requirements, and the ability to handle large volumes of traffic with only some interruption. In their simplest form, traffic signals are a set of three lights facing each lane of an intersection. When the light is green, that lane has the right of way to cross. When the light is red, they don't. The amber light warns that the signal is about to change from green to red. Beyond this basic function, traffic signals can take on innumerable complexities to accommodate all kinds of situations. Let's take a look at a typical intersection here in the US to show how they work. At each approach to an intersection, there are three directions vehicles can go, called movements, right, through, or left. Right and through are usually grouped together as a single movement, so a typical four-way intersection has eight vehicle and four pedestrian movements. These movements can be grouped into phases of the traffic signal. For example, the left turn movements on opposite approaches can be grouped into a single phase because they can both go at the same time without conflicts. Traffic engineers use a ring and barrier diagram to sketch out how different phases of the signal are allowed to operate. Here's the ring and barrier diagram for our example intersection. The first phase is the major street left turns. Then the major street vehicle and pedestrian through movements. A barrier to clear the intersection the minor street left turns, the minor street vehicle and pedestrian through movements, and finally another barrier before the cycle starts again. Hi, I'm Rex Moore with The Motley Fool in front of BMW's self-driving exhibit. There are an endless variety of phasing arrangements that traffic engineers use to accommodate various intersection configurations and traffic volumes for each movement. Even the simple decision of whether to use protected or unprotected left turns takes a significant amount of analysis and consideration. Another important decision is how long each sequence of a phase should last. Ideally, a green light should last at least long enough to clear the queue that built up during the red light. This isn't always possible, especially during peak times on busy intersections. In these cases where the intersection is saturated, the green light might be extended for each phase to minimize the startup and clearance times, which are periods when the intersection isn't being utilized to its maximum capacity. The amber light needs to last long enough for a driver to perceive the warning and decelerate their vehicle to a stop at a comfortable rate. One second for every 10 miles per hour or 16 kilometers per hour on the speed limit is a general rule of thumb. But traffic engineers also take into account the slope of the approach and other local considerations when setting the timing for yellow lights. In most places in North America, you're allowed to enter an intersection for the full duration of a yellow light, which means there needs to be a time when all phases have a red light to allow the intersection to clear. This clearance interval is usually about a second but can be adjusted up or down based on speed limit and intersection size. So far, we've only been talking about signals on a set timing sequence, but most traffic signals these days are more sophisticated than that. Actuated signal control is the term we use for signals that can receive input from the outside and use that information to make decisions about light timing and sequence on the fly. These type of signals rely on data from traffic detection systems. These sensors can be embedded cameras or radars, but most commonly they're inductive loop sensors embedded into the road surface. They are essentially large metal detectors which simply measure whether or not a car or truck is present, sometimes to the annoyance of bicycles, scooters, and motorcycles that may be too small to trigger the loop. 
Whatever the type of sensor, they all feed data into an equipment cabinet located nearby. You've probably seen hundreds of these cabinets without realizing their purpose. Inside this cabinet is a traffic signal controller, essentially a simple computer that is programmed with specific logic to determine when and how long each light will last based on the information from the detectors. Actuated control gives a traffic signal much more flexibility to handle variations in traffic load. For example, if a nearby road is closed and traffic rerouted through a signal that doesn't normally see such high demand, it may need to be reprogrammed before the closure. A light equipped with actuated control will simply see the additional traffic and adjust its phasing accordingly. Same thing with special events like concerts and sports games that create huge traffic demands on irregular schedules, and even seasonal changes in traffic like in major tourist destinations. Actuated systems can also keep you from waiting at a long light when no one's crossing in the other direction. Finally, actuated control can help by giving priority to emergency vehicles and public transportation by using specialized detectors, like infrared or acoustic sensors, that communicate directly with certain types of vehicles. But actuated control isn't the end of the complexity. After all, it still treats each intersection as an isolated entity, when in reality each signal is a component of a larger traffic network. And each component of the traffic network can have an impact, sometimes a major impact, on other components in the system. Take the classic example of two signals closely spaced in a row on a major roadway. If one signal gives a green but the next one doesn't, cars can back up. If they back up far enough, they can sit through multiple cycles at an intersection without being able to pass through until the light beyond clears. It's a frustrating experience for anyone. A signal is inadvertently, but significantly, reducing the capacity of an adjacent signal. One solution to this problem is signal coordination, where lights can not only consider the traffic waiting at their intersection, but also the status of nearby signals. This is a very common configuration on long corridors with relatively minor but frequent cross streets. The signals on the major road are timed so that a large group of vehicles, called a platoon by traffic engineers, can make it all the way through the corridor without interruption. This type of signal coordination can significantly increase the volume of traffic that can pass through intersections, but it really only works on stretches of road that don't have other sources of traffic interruptions, like driveways and businesses. If the platoon can't stick together, the benefits of coordinating signals mostly gets lost. The obvious next step in efficiency is coordination of most or all the signals within a traffic network. This is the job of Adaptive Signal Control Technologies, or ASCT. In adaptive systems, rather than individual groups of lights, all the information from detectors is fed into a centralized system that can use advanced algorithms like machine learning to optimize traffic flow throughout the city. These type of systems can dramatically reduce congestion, but they're only just starting to be implemented in major urban areas. As sensors become more ubiquitous and computing power increases, Traffic management may slowly but surely be relegated from civil engineers to software developers and data scientists. On the complete opposite side of centralization, many believe that self-driving cars are the next revolution in traffic management. If every vehicle could communicate and coordinate with every other vehicle on the road, interrupted traffic control could eventually become a thing of the past. But don't get your hopes too high. In dense urban areas, traffic congestion is often self-limiting. Especially during peak times, for every one person on the road, there are many more at work or at home waiting for the congestion to clear up before they head out. This latent traffic demand means that any increase in capacity will quickly be filled up with more traffic, bringing the congestion back to the same level it was before. Katera was really formed because this industry is so ripe for change. Um, I put up what we have opening for drive times. I didn't put Tuesday up there at all. Let's see what we got here. Oh, the last thing I want to talk about right here is there is a little small light up between the two red lights that are directly in front of us with this car. It's really hard to see. It's called an Opticom light. 
So what I want you to write down, there's a small red light near most major intersections. When that small red light comes on, it indicates that there's an emergency vehicle preparing to get to that intersection. It could be coming towards you, it could be coming behind you, to the left or to the right. But you should take note that when it comes, you need to get out of its way. So in this case, there's nobody off to the right of us. We would probably, if it was coming behind us, we would probably move over to the right to get out of its way. Um, I think I'm going to stop right here because um, I'd like to give you time to do your reading and to finish up uh, providing the question answers to me. Uh, the way I want it, some people are still asking me, how do I want the chapter test? Just write it on a piece of paper and then take a picture of it and send it. That way I can take a look at it on my phone. Uh, that way I'm still finding it hard to find a way to mark it up so you know how you did. But for the most part, people are getting at least most of the questions correct. There aren't any real glaring problems. Um, some of you still haven't accepted the calendar request that I sent to you. Uh, so hopefully you'll start using the calendar to find out what I have for free time. As you can see, I like to schedule three to four days ahead of time. Tomorrow's already booked. Uh, Friday, I've got 1 p.m. Saturday, I've got 11, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And then Monday, I've got 10, 11, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Um, so I want people to uh, start uh, signing up um, if they can. All right. And I'll be taking a look at my phone tonight, seeing where people are asking for requests. And I really want to start putting people in that haven't driven. So if you haven't driven, I would say take a Saturday time, uh, take a time in the afternoon, but please try getting into the uh, queue of, of driving because some people are, are getting three, four. Now, I bet you next week they'll have half their driving done. So this is up to you. You've got to find time. You've got to find a way to make this happen. All right. So that is good. All right. Okay. That's it for tonight. We will see you next Tuesday for class. So next Tuesday, we are going to be covering um, finishing up sign signals, pavement markings, and then we're going to probably get into stopping. And then we're going to probably do Wednesday being with speed and road rage. And then um, we're going to probably do parking in the midterm on Thursday. So that will get us halfway through driver's ed by the end of next week, which is cool. All right, you guys are doing great. Keep up the good work. Make sure that you provide me your homework. Don't let that slack. All right, have a good night, and we'll see you hopefully in the car driving in the next couple days. Have a good one.